1942. Nazi tyranny has engulfed Europe, the Western Soviet Union, and North Africa. Against this backdrop, there seems to be only one force that can take the fight to the heart of Hitler's Third Reich, RAF Bomber Command. But the results have been poor, and the cost has been high. As a new commander takes charge, he brings with him a bold new plan which he believes will be the first knockout blow of the war. And to deliver it, he plans to send over 1,000 bombers to hit a single German city. This is the story of Operation Millennium, the first 1,000 bomber raid. Welcome to Wars of the World. Arthur Travers Harris was born on April 13th, 1892, in Cheltenham, Gloucestershire, England, before his family relocated to the British African possession of Rhodesia, modern-day Zimbabwe. When the Great War broke out in the summer of 1914, he joined the 1st Royal Rhodesian Regiment fighting German colonial troops in southwest Africa, before transferring to England in 1915, where he joined the Army's Royal Flying Corps. On April 1st, 1918, the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service were merged to form the Royal Air Force, the first independent air arm in the world. Following the armistice on November 11th, 1918, Harris found himself with a commission as an RAF officer, helping to police the British Empire. By the late 1930s, Harris was rising up to be one of the top brass of the service, becoming an Air Commodore in 1937 and an Air Vice Marshal in 1939. At the same time, the RAF was undergoing a radical revolution in terms of equipment and structure as the service prepared for the inevitable war in Europe against Nazi Germany. As part of this effort, the RAF was broken up into separate commands, each with a specific function assigned to it, chief of which, as far as operational doctrine was concerned, was RAF Bomber Command, responsible for delivering the service's punch against an enemy nation using fleets of bombers. The rapid modernization of the RAF in the 1930s saw the introduction of more modern and capable bombers like the Bristol Blenheim and Vickers Wellington, and these left the RAF especially confident in its bomber command in 1939. That belief was shattered within weeks, particularly when Germany struck west against the Low Countries and France. A combination of obsolete tactics and heavy German fighter resistance saw Bomber Command aircraft massacred in alarming numbers. This saw a switch to nighttime operations in 1940 and 1941 wherever possible. But while safer for the crews, the results of the early nighttime raids were woeful. Bomber Command had neither the experience nor the equipment to be truly effective. Leading Bomber Command throughout those particularly dark days of 1941 was Air Marshal Sir Richard Pierce. But with such high losses, and very little to actually show for them in terms of damage to the Nazi war machine, his superiors' confidence in him waned, and on January 8, 1942, he was temporarily replaced by Air Vice Marshal Jack Baldwin, who held the post for 45 days until on February 22, 1942, the reins were passed on again, this time to Air Marshal Arthur Harris. Harris had inherited a command that was still reeling from its early experiences in the war, and morale was often low amongst squadrons. In fairness, changes were already being made under Pierce's tenure, such as the introduction of newer, more powerful, four-engine types to replace the earlier twin-engine aircraft, and new nighttime navigation aids, such as the GEE radio system. But bombing operations continued to be hampered by a general inaccuracy and poor operational doctrines. Harris brought with him two fundamental changes to the way Bomber Command would operate under his leadership. The first was that he was among a growing chorus of voices in the Allied leadership that believed that the strategic bombing of German cities and infrastructure had the potential to grind the Nazis into total defeat, and he had a key supporter in the shape of Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Even before Harris had been appointed to lead Bomber Command, Churchill's government had issued the Area Bombing Directive on February 14, 1942, which instructed the force to start the area bombing of German industrial cities, with the simultaneous goal of destroying Germans' means to manufacture war materials and to break the morale of the German people. Harris was only too happy to carry out this directive. Shortly after taking up his new position, he said this publicly. The Nazis entered this war 
and to the rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everybody else and nobody was going to bomb them. At uh, Rotterdam, in London, Warsaw, and half a hundred other places, they put that rather naive theory into operation. They sowed the wind, and now they are going to reap the whirlwind. Harris's bullish command style seemed to reinvigorate Bomber Command, but it would only be for show if this new energy couldn't translate into something tangible, something spectacular. Therefore, having barely finished moving into his new office at RAF High Wycombe, he began to concoct a plan that would show the full potential of the bomber, something that had never been done before that would give results the whole world could see. That plan involved a raid making use of 1,000 bombers. In 1942, this was an unprecedented number. Previous operations hadn't come close to that figure, with the greatest number of bombers the RAF had sent out on a single operation previously, numbering just 300. Harris argued that a thousand bomber raid would have numerous advantages in terms of the destructive power it would unleash on a single target city, and to provide the Allies with an enormous propaganda coup. One that would raise morale amongst the British population, whilst also terrifying German workers in other cities to lay down their tools and flee, lest they become the next target of such a seemingly unthinkable force. Harris's planned operation would also give him the opportunity to test his second biggest doctrinal change to Bomber Command the introduction of the Bomber Stream. Previously, coordinating bombing operations once they had taken off was fairly limited. Aircraft often operated largely on their own, far from each other's positions to avoid collisions in the darkness. Searching for their targets across a blackened Nazi-occupied Europe that was heavily protected by German night fighters and flak, guarding their assigned sectors. The introduction of the GEE navigational aid promised to change all of that. Now bombers could fly more cohesively to a target in assigned areas of a much larger force. Building on this, Harris proposed that the attacking force be focused into a stream of aircraft, smashing through one targeted area of the German defenses, which would then be completely overwhelmed by the sheer weight of numbers they were facing. This bomber stream would also reduce the time RAF aircraft were over the targeted areas where the defenses were often the heaviest. Churchill loved the notion of the Thousand Bomber Raid, although in a meeting with Harris, he did express concerns that putting that many British aircraft into the air at once had the potential for disaster if the Germans reorganized themselves to meet the threat of the bomber stream quicker than Harris anticipated. Reassured by Harris that the German defenses would be completely overwhelmed to prevent such a disaster, Churchill responded that he would be willing to accept the loss of 100 aircraft. There was just one problem. Bomber Command's inventory didn't have anything close to 1,000 operational bombers in early 1942. The most it had was around 400 aircraft, the vast majority of which were still the twin-engined Vickers Wellingtons, as production of the new four-engine heavies, the Short Sterling, the Handley Page Halifax, and the legendary Avro Lancaster were still getting underway. Harris was therefore going to have to scrounge up every bomber he could and find crews to fly them. Much of the shortfall was met by him ordering the aircraft from training units be allocated to the raid, crewed by their instructors, many of whom were experienced veterans undertaking their training duties as part of their rest period before starting a new round of ops. Even then, he was still short of the magic number, and so he turned to another branch of the RAF, namely Coastal Command. Coastal Command was responsible for protecting Britain's coastlines from enemy ships and U-boats, the latter of which was strangling Britain's vital supply lines from North America. They were equipped with various twin engine types, capable of carrying out the raid, including a number of hand-me-downs from Bomber Command, with their crews being used to long-range navigation. Coastal Command crews had also been involved in bombing operations before, such as targeting German invasion barges being assembled along the French coast during the Battle of Britain. However, Harris found resistance from Coastal Command, since despite being a branch of the RAF, it had actually been operating under the control of the Royal Navy since February 1941, as part of an effort to homogenize Britain's maritime defense. The Admiralty was far more concerned with tackling the U-boat menace than helping Harris with what they viewed as little more than a propaganda mission, particularly with the growing influx of American shipping making the dangerous crossing of the North Atlantic, now that the US had joined the war. Harris protested by trying to convince them that through the strategic bombing of German cities and industry, the U-boat fleet would become unsustainable, but the admirals wouldn't have it. With no help from Coastal Command and still short of the magic number, Harris again turned to his training units. 
he was able to scrounge up yet more aircraft that could be made serviceable to meet his demands, including a small handful of former bombers that had been transferred to the RAF Training Command. But now crewing them was becoming his biggest headache. He therefore decided that as many trainees who were close to completing their training as possible would be assigned to the raid. To offset the lack of experience, veteran pilots would be assigned to fly with the green crews wherever possible. But even so, 49 aircraft would still be taking off with pilots who technically hadn't earned their bomber wings yet. Ready for the off, the only question was where to send this vast armada. Berlin would have been the preferred target for its propaganda value, while Churchill wanted to hit Essen for its industrial importance. But it was decided that the 1,000 bomber force should instead be sent to Hamburg. This made strategic sense, since Hamburg was a major industrial city and port, complete with a shipyard, U-boat pens, and major oil refinery. Given the effort it had taken to assemble such a force, a secondary target was selected as a backup, and that target was Cologne. Cologne was Germany's third largest city, and was a major logistics hub with significant road and rail links. The city had an industrial sector, which among other things produced and repaired battle tanks for the German army. But compared to Hamburg's role in the overall war effort, Cologne was far less important materially. However, for Harris, he believed that the psychological impact of a thousand bomber raid would spread far beyond the targeted city. Cologne could still prove a demonstration of his command's awesome destructive power. By late May, his plans were ready, and with Churchill's blessing, he was ready to put his plan into practice under the guise of Operation Millennium. On May 30th, 1942, at 53 bases across England, 1,047 bombers and their crews were sprayed with rain as they waited for the order to set off. Weather had already delayed the operation by three days, and reports from Germany were not looking promising for Hamburg, so Harris selected Cologne as the target. Beginning at 22.30 hours, the night air over eastern England roared in a chorus of aero engines as the bombers took off one by one and formed up into their allocated positions within Harris's bomber stream. In order to protect them, aircraft with trainee pilots were placed near the center of the stream. Bearing the brunt of the operation were 602 Vickers Wellingtons, which until the arrival of the newer four-engine heavies had been the darling of Bomber Command's operations, its unique geodetic fuselage design making it a rather tough old bird. Of the new heavies, there were 131 Halifaxes, 83 Stirlings, and 73 Lancasters, many of their crews still learning the ropes on these new, more complicated aircraft. The remaining numbers were made up by twin engine types the newer aircraft were intending to replace, as they had become obsolete in the new total war which Bomber Command was waging. 79 were Handley Page Hamptons, an aircraft nicknamed as the Flying Suitcase for its narrow fuselage design. 46 were Avro Manchesters, the unreliable precursor to the Lancaster that was plagued by overly complex engines which liked to destroy themselves when pushed. And 28 were Armstrong Whitworth Whitleys, an aircraft only marginally superior to the biplane bombers it replaced in 1937. Since not all the aircraft involved were equipped with the GEE system, those that were led the stream, the idea being that when they dropped their weapons on their targets, the fires would act as markers for the following aircraft to find their targets. The aircraft carried a mix of high explosives and incendiary ordnance, the high explosives being intended to destroy walls and roofs so that the fires started by the incendiary devices could spread further. Heading over the English Channel and across occupied Holland, the Armada observed heavy cloud below them, but as they headed into Germany, the cloud broke and the moonlight bathed the land in a blue hue. On the ground, one can only imagine how the German defenders must have felt, realizing the scale of what they were facing. Typically, a German night fighter sector could handle six intercepts at once, but with over a thousand aircraft pressing through towards Cologne, Harris was proving the old adage that the bomber would always get through. Nevertheless, the German night fighters put up a staunch resistance. A typical engagement is described in this after-action report from the crew of a Wellington after being attacked by a Messerschmitt BF-110. Although our aircraft took normal evasive action, altering course 30 degrees to port and starboard alternatively, the ME-110 turned and closed in to attack from the starboard quarter at same height. Our rear gunner, Sergeant Dent, fired one seven-second burst at 400 yards range, and enemy aircraft dived and was lost sight of temporarily. Five minutes later, ME-110 appeared once again on the starboard quarter and attacked our aircraft, closing in from 300 yards range, firing three short bursts of both machine gun and cannon. 
Our rear gunner replied, in claims in which he is supported by the second pilot to have secured belly hits at 80 yards range. Enemy aircraft died from view and was not seen again. The enemy aircraft was not seen to crash, but it was probably damaged or destroyed. In Cologne, air raid sirens began wailing, but the population was slow to react, having become complacent about running to their shelters after numerous false alarms, with their city only being hit a handful of times prior. It was as the first bombs began tumbling out of the bomb bays of GEE-equipped Stirlings and Wellingtons onto Newmarked in the city's old town that the city's population realized that they were not being sent to their shelter merely as a precaution. For the next hour and a half, Harris's bomber stream poured into the skies over the city. Despite the size of the force, this was actually considerably shorter than previous smaller raids, where the attacks often went on for up to four hours. Such was the ferocity of the attack that German fire crews became overwhelmed, and by 0115 hours, it appeared as though the whole city was ablaze. Bomber crews in the tail end of the stream were reporting seeing the orange glow on the horizon as far as 100 miles away. Despite being labeled a thousand bomber raid, in actuality only 868 aircraft actually hit the city, the remainder striking other targets such as German night fighter bases to protect the main force. During the raid, an Avro Manchester flown by Flying Officer Leslie Manser was damaged by flak. Manser nursed the crippled bomber out of Germany and over occupied Belgium, but by then it was clear it would never make it across the English Channel. He stayed at the controls, allowing his crew to bail out before he and his aircraft crashed into the Belgium countryside. Based on the testimony of his crew, he was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. During the course of the raid, 411 civilians and 58 German service personnel were killed, and 5,000 more injured. As Harris had hoped, thousands of people did flee the city afterwards for fear of the bombers returning. Almost 13,000 homes were destroyed, with many more being damaged, leaving 45,000 homeless, while 33,000 non-residential buildings were destroyed, including nine hospitals. Much of the destruction was achieved by fires from the incendiary weapons, which spread throughout the city so quickly that firefighting crews were unable to contain them. As a working city, Cologne would take six months to recover. Harris's force lost 41 aircraft in the raid, most of them to night fighters. While significantly lower than the 100 aircraft Churchill was willing to accept, it was still higher than any previous raid. Nevertheless, the raid was heralded as a tremendous success, and Harris became a national hero, earning the nickname Bomber Harris. He would continue hurling huge amounts of bombers against the German cities, believing this would bring about victory, but ultimately, it would take the vast Allied armies to finally strangle the Nazis to death. Harris and the Allied bombing campaign as a whole remains a source of much controversy today. Few would deny that the raids caused great devastation and seriously hindered the Nazi war machine. But given the civilian loss of life and the destruction of historic buildings in the process, the question has to be asked, was there another way?